Okay, everybody, we have a bunch of long-winded speakers today, so um, we need to get started. No one, in this group, no one in this group seems to be able to write a paper less than 35 pages. <laughs> I, yeah. I did, but I'm not sure there's going to be time for me before it's over. <laughs> okay, so our first speaker is Arturo Lopez Levy. Now, Arturo was supposed to be here, but came back from Spain yesterday, exhausted and sick. So he's not making it. So we have last, spent the last two hours trying to get a Skype thing going. Hopefully it's going to work. And uh, there's the ugly old man right there. Um, his, um, the mic output on my, my laptop doesn't seem to be working. So we're going to put this right next to my laptop and we'll see how that works for sound. So Arturo is a lecturer of, at American, of American politics and Latin American politics at the University of Texas, uh, Rio Grande Valley, and at the New York University Center for Global Affairs. He's a non-resident research associate at the Latin American Center at the Joseph Corbel School of International Studies at the University of Denver. He's a co-author of Raul Castro and the New Cuba, a close-up view of chance. He's also done his, a book that has his autobiography in it. And uh, I don't know how many various papers. And he formed me a, he's just won a prize for one of the best um, writers on, on foreign policy issues. And unfortunately, I didn't get where it was. But anyway. <laughs> um, so this paper originally appeared as a report on the Council on Hemi Hemispheric Affairs, just this May, so it's still quite up to date, and I'm sure Arturo will update it as necessary. So um, with that presentation, I'm turning it over to Arturo. Arturo, are you there? I am here. I cannot hear you very well, but I, I'm ready to present whatever you want. OK. Well. I praised you. You didn't need to hear that anyway. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. So should I begin? Yes. So uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Gary Maybarduk for this invitation to be part of this panel at the Association of Cuban Economy. Okay. Is everything okay or not? Yeah. So should I begin the presentation or not? Yes. Okay. So I, I already have thanked the people that invited me there several times, so I'm not going to do it again uh, to save time. Uh, the paper that I'm presenting here was part of a report that I wrote together with R Ralph Otto Niederstrasse for the Council of Hemispheric Affairs. Uh, it is available online. You can Google my name uh, or COA uh, uh, is C O H A, and there is the the report that we wrote about the recent leadership transition in Cuba from Raúl Castro at the presidency to Miguel Díaz Canel. The paper basically uh, try to understand this leadership change in five essential dimensions. Basically, what I will do here is that I will present the most important issues that I covered in this uh, uh, report. And I look forward to the question and answers for uh, a, a, a more comments. So the five issues are, first, the generational transition. Second, the separation of or, or the rise of a civilian to the top position in the Cuban political system, the presidency, uh, after 
a, a presidency that since 1976 was in the hand of a military leader. Third, the separation between the leader of the party and the presidency. And I think this is also a very important issue from an institutional perspective. Uh, for the cycling or the circulation uh, of Cuban elites. I think it's very important that in addition to understanding the generational dimension that we are looking at the leadership change, we look at the fact that just by replacing the people at the top of the system, at the top of the Politburo, the Council of Ministers, the Council of State, the circulation even at the National Assembly, what we see is also a circulation of the network of patronage and uh, 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 social support that exists within the Cuban elite. And five, the issue of foreign policy. What are the differences or the continuity that we register in foreign policy uh, based on this leadership change. I think that the generational transition is very important. And here it is, it is relevant to quote what Samuel Huntington wrote in uh, his uh, major, uh, major book, uh, Political Order in Changing Societies. Huntington said, so long as an organization still has its first set of leaders, so long as procedure is still performed by those who first performed, its adaptability is at doubt. It's still in doubt. And I think this is basically the core of my, of my explanation. We see here, and this is important to take into account, the, uh, tra an intergenerational transition. The transition at the leadership from, from Fidel Castro to Raul Castro, although some people, when they talk about the attack to the Moncada barracks, they talk about people from different generations, mentioning Fidel and even people that were older than Fidel, and the youngest people, in the case of, Fidel, of Raul, Ramiro Valdez, and others, in reality, all of them belong to the same generation. Once you cross the 70s, you, everybody who is above 70 belong to the same generation. And in this case, uh, we, we need to differentiate what was the transition of 2006-2009, consolidated on the Sixth Party Congress in 2011, from the current intergenerational transition that represent people who has lived different experiences and has also different paradigms. I think that when we look at the older generation, we need to uh, uh, be clear of what were the main features of the so-called generation del centenario or generation of the centennial, uh, an attribution to the uh, 100th uh, anniversary of the birth of Jose Martí in 1953 the same years of the attack to the Moncada Valley. Here we have a radical version of nationalism, a permanent denou denunciation of corruption as identified with traditional politics, and traditional politics was seen as a politics of compromise. And in front of this, the Cuban political class, and particularly the Generación del Centenario, cultivate a vision of intransigence in which the paradigm was always to be the most radical, the better. To the point that policy, there were mistakes, uh, if they were uh, made because of the adoption of, let's say, more pro-market policies, at times they were presented as problems of principles. But when the mistakes were made on the other side for an excessive radicalism, an excessive intransigence, it was not seen as a major fault, but as an excessive seal of revolutionary fervor. Uh, and another important uh, characteristic of this the generation of the centenario was a, a, a rejection of any type of subordination 
or accommodation to US, US hegemony in Latin America. The paradigm was an, a heroic paradigm. The idea of anti batista revolt and more than taking pride on the positive, the generation of the centenario represented and took pride on a Cuba that could say no. No to others that began with the United States, first to Washington, but later no to China in the 60s, no to the Soviet Union, etc., etc. I think that there are, in addition to the uh, heroic, heroic experience, the other pillar that was typical of this generation, and they even uh, uh, identified with it, was the model of Fidel at the helm, that it was basically a charismatic model of politics. The, unit, the new generation come from a different experience. If I say that the generation of the centennial uh, claimed credit and took pride on saying no, this is the generation of yes. This is the generation of leaders that climb in the structure of, of power, not by denouncing, not by competing, but by supporting their elders. They didn't uh, 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 subscribe to paradigms of, uh, uh, based on, on challenging. They didn't uh, took pride on so much the heroic paradigms, but on the idea of loyalty, obedience, order, bureaucratic skills to guess and implement decisions that were taken by today's octogenarians that are the ones that are retired. And I think that to manage these intergenerational transitions, we all, uh, it is suggested by theory to look at the, what are called intergenerational bridges. And those are facilitators that help the habituation to the leadership position of the newcomers but at the same time, a soft, softening of the procedure of the retirement of the elders. In this case, I think that we need to look at the role of the Department of Organization and Cadres that was led in the last 20 or 30 years by Jose Ramon Machado Ventura and Abelardo Álvarez Hill, and how they have managed the selection process for those who are being promoted to important positions today. All the new leaders have multiple regional and sectorial experience. Is if we use the analogy of a company, and it is an analogy that we, we cannot overstretch, the, the people like Roberto Morales Ojeda, Diaz Canel, the leaders on the military uh, armies, the Eastern, the Central, and the Western Army, the new members of the Council of Ministers and the Council of State, all of them show a record of working at different levels of this chain of production. They have worked in different provinces, they have worked in different functions, they have worked in different sectors, either in the party and the military, or the party and the government, in more than one provinces. So, in some sense, they have been uh, uh, prepared as products of the system. I, this helps us to question uh, uh, what type of leadership is emerging in Cuba. And I use the typology, the typology of my Gregor Burns, and he distinguished between a transactional or a transformative leader, a transformative leader. And I think that uh, in the short term, at least, uh, Diaz-Canel has no serious challenge to play the role of a transactional leader, because there is a long list of uh, uh, guidelines, agreements, that has been in the books since uh, the Sixth Party Congress in 2011, and later at the Congress in uh, uh, the Seventh Party Congress, and many of those changes has not been implemented. So rather than engaging in a challenge to the system, uh, Diaz-Canel has the possibility of engaging in a serious reform effort and showing the possibility of enhancing his legitimacy by 
uh, demonstrating collegiality, a capacity of coordination, rather of rather than uh, engaging in a massive reforms, as it was the case, for instance, in the party of the Soviet Union with uh, Gorbachev. The second issue that I cover here is the first rise of a civilian to the presidency since 1976. Uh, it is, this is also a very important problem because the, natu the Cuban state is a national security state. And the precedent is that the military has been on top of the civilian realm for quite a long time. We, we can even go beyond 1976 to the uh, origins of the revolution. In the case of, of Diaz-Canel, I think that it is a symbolic positive thing for the system in terms of international legitimacy and also domestically that there is some semblance of subordination of the military to the civilian rule, but in practice there are important challenges there. His military experience is very limited. Some people basically mention that he was, he had an experience as a lieutenant, also that he served in the provinces of, of Villa Clara and Holguin, having a particular connection and good relationship with the Central Army and the Eastern Army, but still not enough to consider him a member of the National Security Establishment. In this sense, I think it will be, uh, he will be very dependent on the tutelage and uh, 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 protection in some sense that he enjoyed uh, by from Raul Castro, who is uh, at the same time the leader of uh, the living leader of the revolution, but also the leader of the military. Uh, how will he manage this relation with the national security complex in a national security state? Well, this is, in my view, one of the most important questions in the, that the system uh, uh, leave uh, as part of this intergenerational transition. Uh, the third part, remember I say, first one, the intergenerational transition, second, the uh, rise of the civilian to the presidency, I think is the separation of the heads of the Communist Party and the Council of State and the Council of Ministers in the post-revolutionary period is something that has not happened also since 1976. And we already have seen, and this is not in the paper because it happened after, that uh, the system is trying to change. And as a big part of the reform is a change on Article 74 of the Constitution and a separation of the president of the council, the president of the country, he used to be the president of the Council of State, and the president of the Council of Ministers. This is a kind of a, a functional differentiation. I don't call it a separation of powers, but it might be able to give some advance of efficiency to the system because it could keep the president of the country together with the position of first secretary of the Communist Party uh, on top and then uh, provide clear measurements of efficiency and the uh, uh, functions of a prime minister in charge of the day-to-day -day running of the government and particularly the management of the economic reform. Uh, what are the, the challenges that I see here? I think, first of all, the management of the constitutional reform. is the first time, I think, that uh, the, 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 the new generation uh, will put its legitimacy uh, on the table and they will see, we will have to see what are the results of the eventual referendum to uh, ratify or reject this constitution. Obviously, in my, in my prediction, the constitution will be ratified, but the question is for how much? Because the threshold of 96% of the population in 1976 it's really a very high threshold, and it will be interesting to see what percentage of the population ratified the uh, constitutional project or the constitutional uh, uh, reform. 
Uh, the second thing is, I think that there are issues that make very difficult this functional differentiation. A very important uh, a challenge is the role of the Communist Party in every one-party state. They are, they penetrate the whole society, they penetrate the whole state, and at times it's very difficult, even if people advocate so, uh, promoting efficiency and technocratic merits to separate the role of the uh, partisan commissars in the management of the day-to-day -day issues of, of government. And there are things that are evidence, even in geographical terms. The palace of the revolution, where the, uh, where the government is, is at the same time, the same building, where the central committee of the Communist Party is, the place where the Council of Ministers is, and the place where the Council of State is. It is very difficult to say that you are separating functions or you are separating roles, not to mention separating powers, when everything is on the same building. Uh, and, 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 and finally, there are, uh, you know, some uh, uh, most recent uh, statements that are very worrisome, such as the one by uh, uh, Toledo Santander, who come uh, in the discussion of the constitutional project with a kind of idea of a divine right of the Communist Party, that in which he even say that the party is above the Constitution. So the four part uh, discuss the circulation of networks of influence and patronage. And I think this is the most difficult part because it's very difficult to identify uh, in the Cuban system uh, the, 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 the links and ties of allegiance between the different... How much time I have? Um, you're almost out. Hmm? You're almost out of time. And you I, got I two minutes. That. Okay? I two and a half, that, I turned uh, the computer off. <laughs> Hello? That's fine. Go ahead. Okay. So I think that the circulation of networks of influence and patronage is the most difficult to measure, but there is no question that those networks exist within the, the Cuban political system, and there are regional ties, sectorial ties, experience of past experience of being at the Young Communist League that basically build important networks between the, the Cuban elites. Uh, I think that it, it is not difficult to identify three important groups. Those are, those are the military high command, the provincial party SARS, and government technocrats. Uh, I think that it is reasonable to assign power based in this order. This is very important at the systemic level because despite the lack of support and, and, and capacity of mobilization of the opposition, it, it will be an opportunity for systemic change if there are no well-managed issues as part of intra-elite politics. So I'm going to leave it there. I have a, a, a fifth a dimension about foreign policy, but I think it's more interesting to see what the other people in the panel has to say and uh, the questions from the audience. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is well known to this group, Larry Katabaka. Uh, he's, uh, the, um, he's a faculty scholar and a professor of law at the International Law and International Affairs at Pennsylvania State University. He received his BA from Brandeis, an MPP from Harvard. I won't criticize you for that too much. <laughs> <laughs> Having gone down the road, studies down the road. And a JD from Columbia University. Teaches and researches in the area. There we go. He teaches. We can skip all of this. The, what? Uh, we can skip all of this in the efforts of time. I can just. All right. All right. Anyway, he's a good guy. He's been. He's wrote dozens and dozens of papers. 
some of which have influenced me a great deal, which is why he's here. And, um, and he's also on our board. So at that, Larry, take over. Thank you. How do I do this? Um, I reduce him and, yeah, well, no, I think. Let's go to, there Is we go. It? Yeah, no, and thank you very much. And, and I know it's right after the luncheon and there's a lot of stuff cramming your head. So what I'm hoping to do over the next 15 minutes or so is to fill your eyes with pictures so that even if my babbling puts you to sleep, at least there'll be color saturation that, that may do something else. Um, slideshow? Yeah, hold on. Beginning. Yeah, there you go. All right, there you go. Um, Right, and what I'm going to be talking about, mostly in English, I'll try to do a little Spanish. It's just, I'll, I'll start going and, and I won't stop. I'm looking at, again, this is after roll, I'm looking at the way in which one can preserve the revolutionary moment in changing times. And indeed, you, if you want to reduce the next 15 minutes to an image, this is probably the best image to think of. And it's the quandary that both Cuba and the outside world faces now. You've got an old castle that is still standing and it is heavily protected from the outside. But look carefully at the cannons, right? Not only are they antiquated, but you've now covered them up. And yet that is the situation in which we stand both from the outside and the inside. And what I'm gonna to try to do over the course of the next uh, uh, 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes, is try to explain to you why this is. Again, not just from the inside, but from the outside as well. Now, we live, is there a way of moving the image a little bit? Yeah, sure. Of Arturo's image. Anyway, the, what the, the slide says is that change is in the air. And of course, change is very much in the air, but like the castle, one wonders just how much change there is, which is why I put these two pictures up. They look very similar, except one's in color, right? But if you look at the structure of the images, not much has changed. An outsider, an insider, charismatic, non-charismatic brother. This, this, I know how to do it. all right, it doesn't matter, yeah. all right. Change is supposed to be in the air. It's a time of transition, right? And there's a bunch of transitions. I've listed four here, right? There's personal changes at the top. Miguel Maria, uh, Mario Diaz Canel is the president. The ideological model has been debated over the course of uh, three to four to five, probably longer, uh, producing the Concepcionalización del Modelo Económico y Social Cubano de Desarrollo Socialista. The economic model has changed as well, producing at the same time the Plan Nacional de Desarrollo Económico y Social hasta 2030, and the, uh, the, propos the, the proposal for a new vision of the nation, its uh, sectors and its strategies, right? And to culminate all of this, right, the icing on the cake is the discursive performance of constitutional revision, which is streamed 24-7 in all media. Right, so there's a lot of transitions going on, but is it a time of change? And that's really the issue. We're back to the, uh, the, 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 the castle. There are personnel changes at the time, but Raul Castro remains first secretary of the Communist Party, which leaves him in the most advantageous position within the structures of the political state and the administrative state. The ideological model appears to be changing through the conceptualization, but the conceptualization itself appears to look backwards quite aggressively than looking forwards. The economic model appears to be changing too, and yet the economic model seizes on probably the best expression of fully developed Soviet economic planning ideology that one has seen in a generation, and then modernizes it for the era of globalization. And the constitutional revision performance is itself not a suggestion of change, but merely the memorialization of changes that have been made in fits and starts since 2008. So we have transitions, do we have change, right? Whichever we have, each of these has given rise to a, a set of global expectations. And of course, I, 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 these pictures are only worthwhile if you look at them all together. Uh, there isn't a leader who doesn't wind up coming uh, to Cuba uh, every once in a while. You have the European 
uh, um, the, the European Minister for Trade who signed the, the agreement, in, and of course she shows up in January, not in July, uh, in Cuba. You've got um, uh, Xi Jinping, you've got our friend from Russia, and then of course you've got um, the Cuban leadership's two best friends uh, from the United States. You have the current president and the former president, each of whom really is quite symbolic of an expectation externally of changes internally in the way in which Cuba relates to the world. Now, to the advantage of each of these people in an inconsistent way, that's true, but there is an expectation of change brought on by these notions of change and, and transitions within Cuba itself. So might this suggest, given all of these changes, transitions, whether they work or not, whether they're inside or outside, might this suggest, and of course I'm playing with words here for those of you who remember this, might this produce a Cuban adjustment program of some kind? Right? And so the issue that I pose for, for consideration for the rest of the is, is a very simple one. What internal Cuban legal adjustments are going to be necessary for Cuba to enter into fully normalized relationships with the U.S. and with the rest of the world? That is, to what extent are the changes being proposed or possible within a refashioned Cuba likely to mesh with the development of consensus or lack of consensus, fractured sense of the expectations of Cuba's role well, within um, emerging global structures. And for my purposes, I actually look at it as uh, requiring answers to three questions. And I'm going to look very briefly at the three questions. I will have then bored you to death, and we'll sit down, and, and you can hear something more interesting. So what are the three questions? The first, of course, is the character and scope of the adjustments that Cuba has to undertake if it's to embed itself within the structures of global trade and finance. No one has any say in this anymore. Globalizations and the structures have now been created in ways that are very difficult to fight. Although I'm going to take a moment to talk about the current battle between the Americans and the Chinese that erupted yesterday at the WTO, so that, that uh, statement may need some changing. Right? To what extent does Cuba have to make changes? The second question. To what extent is Cuba disposed to consider these possible reforms? It's one thing for the outside to explain what the global consensus looks like. It's another to consider not their willingness, but their ideological capacity to actually entertain and move these changes forward. And I'm going to suggest to you that the space that the Cubans have is very, very, very narrow indeed, and made more narrow by the developments within both the party and the administrative structures over the last five years. And then the third is, well, if that's the case, what we're going to see is dissonance, right? Then to what extent might there be something that is possible after the uh, U.S. elections of 2016, but coming from outside of the United States? That's what I'm going to look at and uh, hopefully give a measure of hope uh, of some kind in, in my own way. All right, so very, very quickly, baseline expectations are fairly well known. Uh, in this organization, we've debated this for 30 years. Outside of this organization, everyone has had something to say about this. I'm not going to spend very much time on it. I've broken it down into two ma four major categories, internal legal changes. Everyone knows this. There are probably half a dozen law firms that have already rewritten the civil uh, administrative and labor codes of Cuba three or four or five times waiting for a moment when it can be um, uh, it can be made into law. We understand all of these changes are going to have to occur within Cuba if Cuba is meant to deeply embed, not just in its internal, in its external relations, but its internal relations as well, contract labor judicial system toward the protection of foreign interests and the opening up of the internal economy. Ooh, there's going to be a line. The second and again, equally difficult, the baseline expectation is membership in major multilateral actors, including the two that Cuba finds most difficult to swallow, and that's the World Bank and the IMF. Right? Um, there may be hope with the Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank, AIIB, and the Belt and Road. I'm going to talk about that uh, a little bit in a, in a moment. But that is a core expectation. It's very difficult for a country to, continue to work in global financial flows without some kind of connection there, as well as regional associations, the OAS. But note here the alternatives. There's been ALBA. Everyone laughs at ALBA, but one shouldn't laugh all that much. ALBA has been in its own 
interesting way, effective enough for Cuba's needs from time to time. And of course, the new uh, person on the block, the Association of Caribbean and Latin American States, CELAC, which Cuba is now pushing as a viable alternative to the OAS. Right. International remedial frameworks have to be worked on. We had a really wonderful session this morning on arbitration regimes. Um, but here, more critically, is Cuba's need to ramp up its WTO participation. And then the last is, of course, the one that no one likes to hear, but it's becoming important in the context of global regulations of production chains, and that is conformity with international human rights norms. Even if Cuba doesn't want to, its partners will have to, and if it's European partners, that will increasingly become mandatory as uh, France, Germany, Switzerland, Sweden, and the UK begin to change their laws first to disclosure and then to mandatory actions. That's coming in the next five to 10 years. All right, so that's your baseline expectations. What's the reality? Well, the reality after 2016 is uh, fairly modest. Uh, US-Cuban relations are essentially off the table, forget the bids. Uh, and the U.S. has re-energized -energ its opposition to state-based subsidized economies as a contributing member of globalized um, economic relations and indeed is now going from merely tolerant to actively uh, against the systems in international forum. The affair of the sonic weapons attack um, has had an effect on the, uh, the relationships, not just between the U.S. and Cuba, but now increasingly between the U.S. and China uh, and some of the, the Russian satellites. There's been no movement on the part of Cuba to join the IFIs, with the possible exception of AIIB. I'm not sure. Cuba remains extraordinarily quiet at WTO. Little movement towards the OAS, a celebration of CELAC, right? Trade continues to be funneled through special economic zones, it's like visiting Guangzhou in 1983, um, but that is what is produced as global modernity within Cuba as their answer to uh, their need to, to um, work within uh, uh, global economics. There's been absolutely no movement to liberalize the private sector. Yeah, you're all going to say that I'm absolutely wrong and that I'm crazy and that I can, I can point to five restaurants here and a taxi service there. But from the perspective of deeply embedded, significant private sector liberalization, you do not have that within the structures of the Cuban administrative state. And there is a greater focus on state-to-state -state trade. Um, and a greater reluctance to have any recognition of the power or effect or the utility of markets. That's where we are. The model that we have is the Marielle model, and this is from one of their brochures. I love it. The Marielle model, I'm going to get in trouble for this. It reminds me, I've got five minutes, we'll do this quick. The Marielle model reminds me very much of Twitter, right? What they offer, and, and so we have nothing to complain about, although we like to, right? Oh my God, they're going to funnel everything through these little special economic zones and going to make the country impermeable. But then think about Twitter headquarters south of Market in San Francisco that offers you a 24 7 environment for your workers. You live there or nearby, you work there, your psychological services are there, your grocery store is there, your yoga is there. You never have to leave the place and it's all self-contained. That's the model that they're offering. It's a model that worked for China a generation ago. That's what they're looking to do. So what does this mean in terms of the Cuban capacity to reform? And I'm going to look at it from three perspectives. Um, from starting from a view of the revolutionary principles to look at their politics, economics, and, um, and social organization. Well, the Cuban capacity for reform is grounded in the reification, the refinement of revolutionary principles. They have finally managed to distill 70 years of rhetoric into not one or two, but seven principles that guide the construction of politics, the construction of economics, and the construction of the social order in Cuba. And here they are. Um, the colors are more vibrant on my machine, but pretend that they're vibrant, right? Unity and independence of the Cuban people, popular support of the leadership role of the Communist Party, the universality of social welfare services, the strengthening of Cuban values and enhancement of Cuban culture as understood through the leadership of the Communist Party, active engagement in socialist civil society, productive capacity to engage in global commerce, and augmented international prestige. That's what guides 
the three areas, politics, economics, and society. This is from the Concepcionalización, by the way. I'm not making this stuff up. Um, I'm not that clever. And so when we look at all of this, how does this translate into the Cuban capacity for reform? With respect to political form, it is grounded in a very simple formula, and that is to build a comprehensive socialist society that is prosperous and sustainable. This sounds like rhetoric, it is not. It is a key instruction and a constraint for the organization of politics. Impulsar y consolidar la construcción de una sociedad socialista, próspera y sostenible, right? And how does this work out? Politics has to be grounded to build this society on three core transformations. The first is the consolidation of state ownership of the means of production. The second is the need to accommodate foreign, nation, foreign notions of ownership and production and the complementarity of private enterprise within Cuba, core political notions. And the third is the enhancements of the state's role in the direct responsibility for economic planning and direction. That's the ground rules for the construction of an administrative apparatus under the leadership of the Communist Party, built into and from the Seventh Party Congress, and a direct descendant of what had started out as something that looked very different with the lineamientos in the Sixth Party Congress. But this is what you have. All right. Where does that take us? With respect to the constitutional project, well, the constitutional project, then, for those of you who don't know this, this is a Nikisi. Uh, this one is particularly from uh, Central Africa. They're all over Cuba as well, if you know where to look, right? The constitutional project then becomes nothing more than that central space within which the priests, the Nagangas, will input, I got one minute, I'll do this fast, will put these values for the construction. But what are you constructing? Are you constructing a state or state apparatus? I think you're constructing something very different, right? The capacity for economic reform, two models. Internally, no substantial market-oriented private sector. Right? The sector continues to be, the state sector is the key uh, engine of economic activity. Private activity is complementary, heavily regulated through licensing and through management. Externally, Cuba will play the market on a state to state or state to enterprise basis. But there is a wall between Cuba's willingness to engage in global production, which ends at the border, and their willingness to open their internal operations to that. The essence of central planning, the conceptualization goes through and the, uh, the uh, economic plan goes through. There's really four sections, all of which are designed to use the apparatus of state. I'll, I'll summarize, all of these are designed to use the apparatus of state for the enhancement of planning, planning being a substitute for markets, right? And that leaves a third, which is the Cuban capacity for social organization, and here's the key. Here's the key. The problem with central planning the Cubans will tell us, some Cubans anyway will tell us, is not a problem of market substitution or inefficiency of planning with respect to markets. The problem of central planning that has to be fixed is not capital, it's labor. And that the essence of the Cuban state in the societal sector has to be the reform of the worker itself to create a model worker in a model state, productive, an astute consumer of objects, culture, and leisure, right? And one who works like capital as a part of the productive forces necessary to build the wealth that is required for the objects of the, of the, of the country. This is what's left to the private sector, right? Sometimes it's prettier, they paint the walls, sometimes it's not. This is the private sector in Cuba. Compare this to the picture of Marielle. That's the difference between the two. And that explains, that defines the baseline, the core differences, the core constraints between the state sector and the private sector in Cuba. So what is this model worker? Again, it's like labor, it's like capital, it's a means of production. He's guided by notions of social justice. He is to be worked on, monitored, supervised, made more efficient, made happy in his or her role, a happy worker, a worker that consumes, I'm almost done. Can I have a minute? <laughs> a minute? Maybe. Or <laughs> right, I'll stop. Go ahead. All right, all right. There's nothing left. So what is there left? If that's the case, notice what's happened here. You've got a set of global expectations, which are 
almost, almost impossible to square with the capacity, the ideological capacity of the Cuban state to meet it, either in the organization of its politics, of its economics, or of its societal approaches. The Americans, they don't care. Well, that's being harsh. The Americans are, as they've been since 1959, befuddled. Um, but now in a new way, a transitional way, but they still are. The Europeans keep hanging in. I just love this picture, which is why I put it up at every opportunity, the very famous picture of Mrs. Merkel uh, and our president. Right? And You're so done. Your, hmm? You're done. I'm done. <laughs> All right. That's it. New partners, and thank you very much. <laughs>
aid and, and assistance from its experts. So Cuba also, uh, before um, Raul Castro and uh, Fidel Castro liked to use several organizations such as uh, the Departamento America, the, uh, the Central Committee, um, Departamento de Relaciones Internacionales of the same party, uh, all the institutions like uh, ICAP, uh, Instituto Cubano Amigo de Amistad con los Pueblos, La OSPAL, and also uh, OCLAI, as organizations to engage in high uh, politics, high international politics, uh, and that was used also for, as I said, to promote their relations not just with uh, Middle East and, and and other and the, um, the Soviet Union, but also with some leftist uh, movements in, in, La in Latin America. Since Castro assumed power, Raul Castro assumed power, uh, Raul Castro has always seen himself as a very, very bureaucratic uh, guy. Uh, and that, for example, we can see that since he uh, assumed power, a concept of civil society has been used in, in the island. Uh, before, uh, when Fidel Castro was, uh, uh, was in power, civil society was not seen as, 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 as a very um, relevant term. But then when Raul Castro came to power, uh, we have seen uh, from both internally, uh, domestic in, in the country, and, ex and externally, the concept of civil society being used more uh, prolifically. Uh, and we have seen, for example, the case of several organizations, such as the Catholic Church, the Patronato Hebreo, the, the, the Jewish people, La uh, Unión Árabe de Cuba, and then their participation also in the different uh, summits of the Americas that Cuba has uh, have been, both in Colombia and recently in, in Lima. Um, and also, we have to differentiate those, uh, those organizations that engage in, in high politics and those organizations that engage in, in lower politics. Uh, in higher politics, I said before, uh, ICAP, OSPAL, OCLAI, and how low uh, uh, power, low politics, those organizations such as the Church, uh, the United Nations Association of Cuba, uh, and all the um, academic associations in Cuba, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Raul Castro has also seen the U.S. Uh, Cuban foreign policy lately uh, very, in, um, from a dependency theory, um, and that has been always also teached in, in the ISRI, in the um, uh, uh, Diplomatic Academy in Cuba. So in some, in some way, they have had to engage with different organizations such as uh, non-aligned movement. We have to remember that Cuba was uh, the president of the non-aligned movement, uh, the group of 77, ALBA as well. But also, and even in, in 1991 uh, with Fidel Castro, Cuba was a member of the United Nations Security Council from 1990 to 1991. And uh, Cuba has al also lately has very active in, for example, in uh, uh, world trade organizations and other organizations that doesn't align specifically with uh, the Marxist ideology that Cuba has had, uh, but nevertheless, Cuba since the, uh, has been seeing uh, this participation as a rational um, perspective, with a, with a rational perspective, in order to uh, promote its self-survivance uh, of, the, of the country. In Latin America, uh, the Cuban government, after the Cold War, started to use the soft power. And uh, it appears to have resulted in, in since uh, 2000 or 1999 when Chavez uh, won power. So we have to remember that um, in 1991, um, Chavez won uh, the power, democratically elected. And then uh, other countries like Evo Morales uh, in Bolivia, uh, Correa in Ecuador, and um, uh, Daniel Ortega in Nicaragua. With the United States, although, uh, Raul Castro, from the, the, from the very beginning of uh, his presidency, he wanted to engage with the United States both times that he publicly said uh, under the Bush administration it was turned down by the Department of State. Um, in 2012, 
before the revolu before the re uh, relations had been restored, Cuba had imported uh, had imported approximately 509 million dollars uh, worth of products from the United States. In 2016, after the restoration of relations, the imports amounted to approximately 262 million. So Cubans, when uh, when the United States uh, and Cuba they restored uh, diplomatic relations, Cubans, both the citizens and the government. They saw this as a huge moment for improvement of the of the life. It has looks like it's not has not been the case if we took into account these uh, numbers. Uh, in the case of OWAS, for example, and, and that has been a very specific case of uh, ideology still um, reigning in the United, in the Cuban foreign policy. Cuba has not uh, uh, joined the, the United the OWAS. And has said that they would never, the Cuban government would never um, join OAS. And therefore, now we have uh, Diaz Canela's president. Although this president has, uh, has portrayed himself as a continuity, uh, looks like it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a, conti um, a continuity from uh, the previous foreign uh, policy, Cuban foreign policy. So we have, for example, that in the recent Council of Ministers, he, he didn't change any, any major uh, player of, or key minister in, in foreign policy. For example, we have the same foreign minister, Bruno Rodriguez Parrilla, and we have the same foreign trade uh, minister, um, that's uh, Rodrigo Mamierca. Only he, he only changed uh, minister of economy. And we have to see, al although uh, Diaz-Canel has um, recently took power or has assumed the presidency, he, the first guy who he visited, or, or he actually, yeah, he visited was Nicolás Maduro in Venezuela. And the first uh, person, or the first president that he received in Havana was actually uh, Nicolás Maduro from Venezuela. And the second guy the next day, the next day was um, Evo Morales uh, from Bolivia. So in my, in my sense, uh, Díaz-Canel is portraying, and he's, he's, he's playing a very safe role in Cuba. And he is portraying himself as continuity. I don't see that we will see in any, in any, um, in any next in the next two years any major change of um, of um, change in the U.S. foreign policy. Uh, we have now with uh, the European, and obviously this is a, a major um, uh, fact that uh, Cuba needs a, uh, its foreign investment uh, from basically the United States and uh, the European Union, who are the main. Um, FDI exporters. But in the same way that Diaz Canel is not uh, a historical guy, he's, he can portray this as an opportunity and he can engage with uh, the major players in, in the European Union, as, uh, for example, uh, Germany, um, even Spain, Italy, and the, uh, the French Republic, as a guy who is changing the, the panoramic in, in Cuba. We have to see how it is playing. Now the French foreign minister will visit Cuba, um, and we'll have to, say how, to see how this uh, plays for both countries. Perfect. Absolutely perfect timing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. It doesn't happen very often. In fact, I think if we looked at uh, all the other panels, I doubt to find a single person who stayed in time. <laughs> Come to the board, join the board. Okay. So it's my turn. Um, I just have a very short PowerPoint. Very, very, very short. Three slides. Okay. My paper was supposed to be shorter than the others because I really was going to use their material and simply refer back to it. And to some extent, I'll still do that, but you know, creative minds do things they're not supposed to do, at least according to the way <laughs> plans go. There's central planning that failed. Um, can you hear me? OK. Cuba's political and economic arteriosclerosis, it's not just the Castros. 
Cuba has become an enigma. Even after the death of Fidel, even after Fidel admitted on Cuban, the Cuban economic model was not working, even after some attempts, tentative attempts to upgrade the economy by his brother, even after the loss of foreign benefactors, and despite the economic hardships of the Cuban people, economic reform has largely remained paralyzed. The question, of course, is why? Should have done that first. The most common explanation blames Raul and the revolutionary dinosaurs around him. Not so much here, but if you read, you know, letters to the editor and some of the other places. The argument assumes that the leaders will want to maintain power either for themselves or their heirs. And have little incentive to change the system. At best, this theory predicts that little will change until Raul, Raul leaves the scene completely. I will argue in this paper, oh, by the way, you're the time people. Oh, OK. <laughs> and if I go more than 15 minutes, you'd haul me away. All right. I will argue in this paper that while this theory is largely correct, it is incomplete. It does not explain why there is insufficient incentive to make the necessary economic changes, nor does it explain the underlying political culture that supports this theory. This paper will argue that the underlying political culture put together over many years by Raul and Fidel is essentially stable and likely to survive Raul's departure for at least another generation. There are numerous barriers to change. You can read them there. I won't go ahead and list them now because I'm going to talk to each one. I've got six categories. They overlap. You could go various ways with it. And my paper overlaps too much as well. But anyway, fear of losing control. At all levels, Cuban authorities must worry about losing control. Cuban authorities are always ready to imprison or temporarily detain visible dissidents. But political control has always depended more on control of the economic system. Before the beginning of the special period, the state controlled where you lived, where you worked, how much you made. You obtained considerable durables not from a store, but from your place of work. For high productivity, but always dependent on your political reliability. You always voted and regularly attended mass rallies and demonstrations, as well as your Committee for Defense and Revolutionary meetings. Much of this control disappeared during and after the special period. Some, quint some private commerce, quintuple pieces, were allowed. Remittances from abroad began to flow. The authorities could no longer assume that the luxuries people enjoyed came from illegal dealings, although they often did. The government no longer had the resources to provide the extras through the workplace, and in many districts, the power of the CDRs began to wane. Instead, the government put regulations on the cuenta propistas. Those of you asleep, please wake up. <laughs> Thank you. Instead, they put the regulations on the quintuple pieces, a process they have been refining ever since the beginning of the special period. The government has understood the value of the private sector, but has feared its ability to diminish their political control. Party officials and military officials also fear losing their control because it 
threatens their jobs and privileges. New license for Quinta Propistas was suspended in August 2017. It should not have been a surprise. The problem of collecting taxes from the private sector has been a concern since the 1990s. Um, a Cuban economist at our meeting in Puerto Rico told me I, I questioned this issue. I said, look, you've got a pretty strict tax law and inspectors are everywhere. And she said, yes, Gary. But um, it turns out it costs us as much to collect the taxes as it does to receive. So they do have a tax problem. Um, but in the Seventh Party Congress, party officials also made clear their intention to prevent the accumulation of wealth. That's a concept that goes back to the 80s when Fidel canceled the first attempt at agricultural reform. But it's really not been a major point of the party until really since the Seventh Party Congress. Technology, it seems to elude me at the moment. Collectively, the threat of loss of control presents a barrier to political and economic change. Winding its way through all the concerns of the various parties is the thorny vine of ideology. Presumably a critical concern to some and much less concern to others. Ideology provides a legitimacy to the existing order. So in recent years, Larry has produced a series of deeply probing and illuminating articles analyzing Cuba's Marxist economy. And since he already spoke to that to some part today, I'm going to skip a lot of this part of the paper. Key points, Cuban ideology essentially was fixed very early in the revolution and has, made largely imper and has been made largely impermeable since. He compares Marxist Leninism of Cuba to the Chinese version which undergo the latter version, which undergoes regular modifications to meet the conditions of time. Cuban ideology paralyzes Chinese ideology in that it considers the party the vanguard of the society that leads the government. It differs, however, in its assistance that the party must control all aspects of the economy. With the issue of the Lindemiantos in 2012, it appeared the party might be willing to broaden the scope of activity of the national private sector. It also seemed to welcome the prospect of controlled private investment. And the following year, it introduced what appeared to be a welcoming foreign investment law. After that, however, Cuban policymakers seemed to have had trouble digesting the lineamientos. Five years later, only 20% of them were completed. Foreign private investment seems to get lost in the approval process. By the time of the Seventh Party Congress, and even after the reestablishment of U.S. Cuban government relations and a loosening, a loosening, not elimination, but loosening of the U.S. embargo, Cuba took a significant step backward. It re emphasized the role of the party and state control. It accepted rather reluctantly that there was a role for a limited domestic private sector, but made it clear it could take back those property rights at any time. Interestingly, that doesn't seem to be in the new constitution, that last part, although we don't know enough yet. And then, as I mentioned before, it took another step to ensure its control. While long out of policy of preventing the concentration of power, it added another prohibition against the concentration of wealth. And that's clearly in the new constitution, although again debated. OK, so I quote Larry to a great extent, but he's sorry, Larry. Um, <laughs> if Larry is correct, I suspect he is, and if those ideological views extend to the upcoming generation of the party, of party leaders, then those views will be a barrier to change that might survive another decade or two. I suspect that strict ideology will be less important to the younger cadres, 
but the self-interest of the nomenclatura is consistent with the need for party control, and the two, for, two therefore interlock and reinforce each other. Now note how they fit together in this pattern. The nomenclatura, the nomenclatura will prefer the status quo to protect their interests. Ideology also advocates the status quo, and the party, the supposed vanguard of it all, cannot lead because its members are also part of the nomenclatura and because they are the keepers of the ideology. So together, the interlock again, with the party coming this way, and I tried to do that on a slide, but I couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, <laughs> the interlock in, into an almost unbreakable wall. One could help hope, find hope that the, in the Chinese experience after Mao. When new leadership took the Chinese Communist Party and ideology in a new, no, direction. <laughs> However, Arturo, in a conversation with me a couple years ago, has argued that the more significance between China and Cuba has been the power of the nomenclatura and the lower level bureaucrats in the Communist Party, and et cetera, all of whom benefit from the current system. He argues that Jin Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping, I can't remember how to Deng, Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping, reforms of the late 1970s came after the Chinese bureaucracy had been decimated or at least cowed by the Cultural Revolution. Cuban bureaucracy has encountered no such disruption or purge. So I, my last contribution here really is, is introduction of party democracy. As the leader of the revolution, Fidel was able to maintain sole leadership of the party, government, and military. Could, Fidel could and did make abrupt changes in policy without facing any serious dissent. Raul has operated differently. He is the organization man. As president and first secretary, Raul expressed the desire to introduce democracy within the party. Although it is not clear how far he succeeded, he often went through significant efforts at serving the party for their ideas. And Arturo in his paper discusses this quite thoroughly. I think Larry does too. I mean, if you read the, his role speeches to the Sixth and Seventh Party Congress, he talks about the whole process. Seventh Party list came out with a list of guidelines that were to guide the nation when it is. It led like a work of central planners, which it was, still with the hope of foreign investment, acceptance of the private sector, and a promise of heretical status for all types of ownership and turning cooperatives, many of us read the results as the beginning of a significant step to stimulating growth. The lack of progress for the last five years and later reflects, I believe, not only the overambitious scope of the Lidomientos, but also a lack of consensus at all levels of government and party. So, who was responsible for pushing back on the apparent opening of the Sixth Party Congress? That's a good question. The question is, who is dictating the ideology? And is it less an issue of philosophical differences and more of special interests? And I'll leave that question open. I got something to, what to watch for, but we'll pass that. Alternative scenarios, I think I'll look past that. Shame, I like that. Conclusion. Cuba's leaders are going around in circles. They have too many goals and not enough means. Economist here, is that an overdetermined system? I can't remember. But anyway, in a broader sense, they are stuck between preserving their social system and bring in prosperity they need to preserve that system. They are stuck between economic efficiency and deeply held ideological beliefs. They are stuck between getting rid of the multiple exchange rate and preserving state corporations and preventing social unrest. 
They are stuck between allowing development of a, prong, a strong private sector and preventing the concentration of wealth that the system is supposed to prevent. They are stuck because a solution that allows greater entrepreneurship will provide resistance by the bureaucracy whose privileges will be threatened. And so they go in circles from economic liberalization to economic repression. Got it. I got the minutes fine. They cannot bring themselves to the realization that they have to let go of something before they can devise a coherent strategy. And I think they are stuck because there is no obvious leader who can see the problem clearly and who can bring the rest of the leadership along. Okay. How much time we got left? Uh, seconds. I mean, for the panel. Oh, uh, Half an hour. we've got time for questions. Good. Right. Okay. So I'm going to start out with questions for the panel, and uh, let's see. We've got to make sure that. Um, no, I know, but I've got to make sure that we get Arturo. Arturo, are you still there? Arturo. Okay. Oh, I know what I did. <laughs> ah, um. Yeah, hold on a second. Hold on. I turned the speakers down because there was noise, but I don't want to help the microphone. Can you hear me? I hear, I hear you. Oh, great. Okay. Thank you. So, I have several questions from the panel. One quick comment, though. In your papers, if not in the, if not in the um, presentations, you all make re um, reference to Trump and his disrupting of the policy of Obama. And you do it sort of critically. I understand that. But I don't agree with any of you. And since we're on television, I want to make clear that's not an endorsement to our current <laughs> president. Anything but. I would simply argue that while establishing diplomatic relations improves state to state relations and improved cooperation in many areas, there is no evidence that Obama's policy made any difference to the internal situation in Cuba. And, well, I can, okay. So, quickly to move on. Question, Arturo says it is not ideology but politics that's driving the situation in Cuba. Larry says ideology is important. Arturo, can you defend your position? <laughs> and Larry, will the rigid ideology follow through to the younger generation? Arturo, you want to go ahead? Yes. You know, you, you made some comments when you were presenting your paper that went beyond the comments that now you are at the end. Um, but, but I will try to focus on your last question. First of all, I want to recommend people to read Larry Katabaker's papers, because I think they are a, 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 a quite of work that we don't get uh, so frequently. Can you hear me or not? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. So I think, I think I will uh, following your, your, your recommendation, I will try to do a kind of dialogue with, 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 with what Larry said, but my paper was not written as a dialogue with Larry. It was based on making my proposals, and that's why uh, when I said that it was not ideology, I, will, I was referring mainly to a lot of people who claim that the old mentality, that the idea of keeping the name of the Communist Party or 
the references to Marxist Leninism are the main object or the, the main obstacles for the reform. I think that ideology is playing a role. And obviously, Larry made a very good case about that. But from a, a perspective of looking for the most important thing, in my view, it is politics. And I will explain why. I believe that Cuba is a case today of a part So can you hear me? Sí. We so, lost you so, for about five uh, minutes. I don't remember where, where Communist where Party. Take the Communist Party out of the name. Did 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 I where I was what the was the last thing that you hear? Uh taking Communist Party out of the out of the name, right? Yes. Yeah. Taking the Communist Party out of the name. Okay. Well, I, I think that, the, that, that ideology is important, but politics explain more because, as I said, uh, uh, the, the, there are many ideological changes that already has taken place. The idea of building an economy that will include the private sector and the cooperative sector has been a reference in the party documents. Raul Castro, from the leadership position, has said that stigmatizing the self-employed workers and basically the codes that people use for private sector, uh, it is wrong and against the process. Uh, there is a, a, a processing in the main documents of the party in which there is a repudiation even of the idea of excessive equality, or how I say in Spanish, igualitarism. If you read the guidelines, the references to equality are minimal, and you find more references that are critical of excessive uh, devotion to equality, down to the pursuit of equality that is typical of a communist party. So, in my view, the most important thing is to look at the partial reform equilibrium. Certain sectors who profit, who benefit from this partial reform situation. And as winners of this partial reform situation, they basically delay changes that are necessary to complement and to make more efficient the reform. This is this is the answer to to your questions. I, I don't know if if you got it because it was divided in two parts. The second thing is uh, uh, you asked about Trump. I think that there was a liberal fallacy that I honestly, I never took part on that. I never took sides on that. But people who sold the policy of Obama began to say that many of the goals that has been put under the helms Burton model, they will be achieved by the Obama administration uh, 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 policy of rapprochement. I personally, I never okay. believed that. I think that was a liberal fallacy. And they try, they say that frequently. And in the middle of the December 17, uh, 2014 euphoria, I wrote several pieces saying this is baloney. The, the goals of the Health Burton law were interventionist in Cuba, non-realistic, and basically had no possibility to be achieved without a policy like the one that has been recommended by those who support Health Burton or people like Juan J. Lopez, Juan, Juan J. Lopez who wrote a whole uh, book about 
things that look more like the policy that the United States followed against Saddam Hussein. So uh, uh, this idea that uh, a change on the means and a policy by, of rapprochement could achieve regime change as it was planned by the health burden was an illusion and a delusion of those who advocate for that. And still, I know that there are several uh, uh, moving around Washington, etc. One, in politics, once you adjust means, you need to adjust ends. And I think that Obama was smarter than many of those people that were defending his policies when he recognized and acknowledged that he needed to work with the Cuban government in a kind of partnership and build a platform for a future opening of the Cuban society as the result of an economic reform, a political liberalization that changed the relationship between state and society. And I think there are seeds of change already planted, such as an, ex an expansion of the right to own private property, an expansion of freedom of religion, uh, an expansion of the right to travel, and uh, travel, and uh, many other things that in the long term change the political mindset and even it's already having an impact on the terms of debate and the policy frontiers with which the debate is taking place in Cuba. Thank you. Thank you. Just really quickly. Um, oh, I need to go up there. Oh, okay. here you go. Hi. Right. Just really fast. The, the question is, will ideology follow through the younger, younger generation? Surprisingly complex question. And the answer is going to be a lawyer's answer. It's going to be may, yes, but maybe, but it's going to show up in very strange ways. The reason for that is twofold. One is I recall that the nature of the, of the party, it self-selects and it disciplines. If the party is able to maintain along what is now coming out of China, much, much more extensive self-disciplinary techniques for its members, it may be harder to permit ideological factions within the party, but it's not clear yet. In any case, there will be, my guess is the younger generation, some people will reject strongly or not, there will be a just they're going out there, smaller sector of the Soviet style and a larger sector that will be more interested in the Chinese variation. But that's a guess. Luis? Yeah. I would like something about. Uh, no, up here. Because otherwise. Sure. So I would like something about what uh, Larry said. This is not the party, but also the National Assembly. And. Uh, in the case of the National Assembly, you have uh, that body that can approve laws and can actually um, amend the Constitution. But it's, uh, uh, to achieve or to, to be at the National Assembly, you have to, to be or you have to pass through several um, um, uh, steps. One of them are, you know, the, the Las Comisiones de Candidatura, are basically, uh, uh, you know, they present a slate. And, and Okay, um, so we're going to go to questions from the audience, and um, I will repeat those questions to you so you can hear them. Um, gentlemen back there, because you're way in the back, you might not get it. Otherwise, <coughs> the microphone would be better, I think. My name is Orlando Luis Pardo, I'm a Cuban writer from Havana. My question is very simple. Uh, we are talking about constitutional reforms, a process that is going to launch debates in the Cuban workers, blah, blah, blah. But my question is, when is the role of the Communist Party be, besides these kind of the theoretical events or besides the repression in Cuba, when is the role of the Cuban Party be consulted with the Cuban people? Because, for example, I, I consider myself a socialist. I do not have a space in Cuba. Now we are talking about the new, the new law for marrying people of the same sex, but if one of those people are socialist or ecologist or neoliberal or conservative, it will not have a space in the Cuban society. So my question is, why are we not talking about a plebiscite where the Cuban people can somehow confront 
a constitution that uh, sequesters the sovereignty of all Cubans inside on the island and also the three, two million people outside Cuba. I'm talking about when the Communist Party be humble enough to recognize that they are not the owner of the Cuban nation. Okay, uh, make a long story short. When will the Communist Party accept the possibility that the people are sovereign, not the party? And when will they really engage with the people? <coughs> Next question. Primero quisiera decir que a Muchate y Arturo, saludo y comentar lo siguiente. Aquí se ha hablado bastante de ideología. Bien, la ideología predominante en Cuba hoy en día se llama reggaetón. Bien, y hace 30 años todos los profesores universitarios sabíamos perfectamente, estábamos conscientes de que la impartición de la ideología a nivel académico era, como decían nuestros propios estudiantes, incluido ese señor que está ahí en la pantalla, pura baba. Crap. ¿Sí? That's one thing. Second, muy so, importante lo que dijo Arturo. So a comment has been made that the academics and professors in Cuba have known for years that the language that they're supposed to teach about the party and so on is pure crap. Uh, we continue. Second, una cosa muy importante que dijo Arturo. Tenemos que poner toda nuestra atención en los resultados de ese referéndum sobre la Constitución. Porque no va a pasar lo que pasó en 1976. Aquí nadie ha hablado de los resultados electorales de la novena legislatura, donde el 35% de la población no votó siguiendo los lineamientos del partido. O se abstuvo o se fue por la selectividad. Cuando bajen ese proyecto o anteproyecto de constitución, a la calle podemos ver resultados realmente sorprendentes. Más nada. Observation that the referendum that will take place on the Constitution is likely to be very different from previous referendums of this nature, and that everybody could be in a great surprise. Uh, any other questions? Yeah. I will talk in Spanish. Eh, la historia eh, nos ha dado algunos ejemplos en estos casos de transición de figuras decisivas, ¿no? Y yo siempre pienso en la figura de Juan Carlos de Borbón, que fue formado por Franco precisamente para la continuidad de un sistema. Podríamos pensar algún indicio de que en este caso pudiera eh, haber una respuesta de ese tipo es muy amplia la pregunta pero bueno es esperanzadora somebody give me that in English or short in English so I can so we have to, to... sorry what's going on here okay uh, you're ahead of, you, you'll just describe the question to um... Yeah, she's talking about Juan Carlos de Obón in Spain, the king of Spain. The king of Spain. You're talking yeah, about the king Spain. of Spain. Yes, and actually that he was a, a very key figure. Uh, he was a key figure in the transformation yeah. in Spain, yes. And you're looking for somebody like that in Cuba. Is that the... Is there one? My, my paper says no. But anyway, um, all right. Uh, before I let Toro talk, I think I'll ask... Louise, do you have anything to say about the questions? No. Larry? Uh, just very briefly. Um, constitutional reform and the, uh, the role of the Communist Party, um, <laughs> the answer is no, um, that that would subvert the fundamental Leninist notion of the authority of the party itself. For the party to be other than it, uh, a leader 
is to undo it. So the, the, the short answer has to be if you're going to maintain a Marxist-Leninist system, then the party must remain uh, in a leadership position instructing and getting a sense from the people in whatever way they, they, they think appropriate. A lot of people don't like that and it goes against a lot of views, but that's the essence of the Leninism that has been at the center of, of these systems, including that of Cuba. Um, ideology is pure crap dissociated from reality. That has always been the case, but it's been the case in the United States as well. The question though, that's, that's an interesting and important insight, but it leads to a far more important consequence. In the, if that is in fact true, to what extent does ideology, however extraordinarily dissociative it is, to what extent does it still remain a significant barrier to, to formal change? And my argument is that in fact, whatever you believe about the ideology, you don't have to believe it at all. You must understand that it will exert an extraordinary effect on the ability of the institutions to change, which is why it's important to understand it, even if ultimately you believe it's not worth the life energy that it took to understand it. Um, is there a Juan Carlos in Cuba? I don't think so. Who knows, who knows? I hope, but who knows? Okay. Uh, like so, Arturo, you didn't hear Larry's response. He says there's no, no Juan Carlos in Cuba. Actually, Juan Carlos was chosen by Franco. So we have to remember right. that. So, uh, and, and Franco, he decided that uh, Juan Carlos would play the role as, as, a, as a monarch. Um, I, don't, I, I don't think that the Canelli is right now in this, in this position or anyone else in, in, in his cycle. Uh, regarding the, the party, the people, the, the role of the, of the party. I don't think that the, the party will, by itself, will say, okay, enough. <laughs> we have to, to engage in a, in a more uh, liberal uh, democracy. I don't think that the party will say uh, that unless he has or it has to, to say it. Uh, and and the, the, membership, the, the membership of the party will face uh, uh, some major event that it will bring a discussion of okay, what is uh, what is happening right now? What we, we what we will do? Um, in the same in the same way that the Canel now is portraying himself as a as a continuity guy, and after obviously we have to see that he doesn't have the same legitimacy than Raúl Castro, or Fidel Castro, and that could be a, a, a is a challenge for him, but at the same time is an opportunity that he could embrace that and both domestically and, uh, and, and foreign policy. Domestically, we have to, to see the economy is not, uh, it's not good. Actually, I was reading some uh, paper by Pedro Monreal, and he was saying that we need, the Cuban economy needs 70% of uh, annual uh, GDP growth to, to get a, a development of the country. And just 3% to even break, I mean, even, to, to have, you know, uh, to, like to pay all the, the, the external debt, all that kind of stuff. Okay, let, me, uh, let me get a turn on that. Sure, absolutely, yes. Okay. And in 2016 and 2017, the average uh, annual GDP growth was 0.34% uh, of, of, uh, of GDP. It's like, it, no, it makes no sense um, to continue with this economy, with this common economy. Okay, so Turl, I think everybody here has answered that question, the questions, uh, basically, um, our two other panelists seem to think that the party is not going to be able to be the, the, the vanguard for change. Is that right? Uh, sums it up quickly? Well, the vanguard for that kind of change. It will not be the vanguard for that type of change. And that uh, Larry made the point again that whether or not people believe the ideology, it becomes part of the fabric of the society in which you have to operate. So. We have another question waiting, but I'll give you a chance to put in your two cents, maybe three cents. Well, first of all, uh, I think that the analogy with Spain is not a good analogy. To begin with, because, and I will explain basically the premises. Uh, I study the, the idea of transition 
under the perspective of my mentor at Columbia, Al Stepan, and Linz and Stepan in their classical work of problems of democratic transition and consolidation, they emphasize the role of the starting point. And in the case of Spain, it was an authoritarian regime. And in the case of Cuba, we are talking about a post-totalitarian regime with different dimensions of pluralism, mobilization, leadership, and ideology. So since we have talked a little about ideology, I will focus a little on the idea of ideology. And here, I think that the person who asked the question was my former professor, Amuchaste, someone that I share a lot with him, except on the ideas of the Middle East, where I am obviously uh, more leaning toward the Israeli side than, than the other side. Uh, but uh, 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 defining ideology, I think that we need to look at what is the ideology of the system. And I think that you are right, Gary, when you look at the ob obsession for control that comes from the Marxist-Leninist tradition. But the Cuban revolution is at the same time a nationalist revolution. And there is a tension on whether there is a tension on whether okay. to promote the national interest and development as a nationalist goal. Okay. A total, a total, we're being yes. kicked out because we've gone too far. Oh, well, I'm, I'm finishing. Okay. Uh, 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 you, you need to see the tension between the national, nationalist goal of promoting development and the communist goal of preserving control. So, politically, it's, it, the, the solution for this tension is political. It's not a, a it's which faction and group tend to prevail, or what conception tend to prevail, it's either the nationalist or the one that is more communist centered around control. Okay, thank you, Arturo. Um, Maria, we're not going to have time to answer your question, but if you'd like to raise it, then people can talk about it afterwards. Okay, well, Maria Werla was waiting here, but we've run out of time. Thank you, Arturo, thank you, very much. Thank you for participating. And thank you to the panel. I enjoyed it. I learned some stuff.